Hello, friends. We are delighted that once again Jack and I are able to prepare a special video for you and we're focusing our attention in this video on prophecy. And I think you know that this is Jack's first love in the Bible, prophecy. If you watch our weekly telecast, you know that's true. We're going to be talking on this video about the European Union, the New World Order, oh, you hear so much about that today, and the mark of the beast. Just what is this mark? Will everybody have it? We're going to answer a lot of questions about the mark of the beast. And uh, so, no wonder we're excited about this video, Jack. We really are, Rexel, and I have filing cabinets full of information covering these subjects because I've spoken on these topics for years. And I got hundreds and hundreds of articles on the floor. I picked out the ones I felt would most benefit our viewers. And I think you're going to be startled as Rexella shares some of this information with you. Jack, here's some names, and they all had something in common. Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, the Muslim Caliphs, Napoleon, Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin. Do you recognize what they had in common? They all attempted to build a world empire, but because it was not prophetically right and ripe to happen, uh, it didn't succeed. But now we're going to prove to you that the time is right for a world dictator to come into prominence and uh, to actually be able to Tell the world what to do. The time is right, the isn't it? The time is right because of one important verse. Revelation 17.10. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, says, There are seven kingdoms. Five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. The five fallen, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The one that was at his time, so he uses the tense, is, was Rome. And then he says there is one yet to come, and there'll be a long delay before it comes, but it will be the revived Roman Empire. Get that term in your mind, the revived Roman Empire, because it is now here. And out of this empire arises an antichrist, for John goes on to say, when he has come, out of this revived Roman Empire, the European community, now the European Union, then he must or will reign for a short time. How long is that? For a total of 84 months. In Daniel 9.27, he makes a peace contract with the nations of earth for seven years. Now, during the first 42 months, he is controlled by satanic powers, Revelation 13, 4. But during the second 42 months, Satan is cast out of heaven in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 11, and now incarnates the body of Antichrist in Revelation 13, 12. And because Satan is within him, he now calls himself God, Daniel 11:36. But it's for a short time, just seven years, 84 months. Now, the Jewish calendar had 360 days per year, so seven times 360 is a total of 2,520 days, and one half of that is 1,260 days to prove what we're saying in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 6. That's interesting, Jack. For the first three and a half years of the seven-year period that we call the Great Tribulation, uh, he is not incarnated by Satan. Only the last three and a half years, correct? Right, and we'll prove all that later. Mm. In 1948, three major world events occurred, and the Bible said that they would happen approximately at the same time. Now, Jack, will you refresh our memories as to what happened in 1948? This is why we believe we are in that time era just before Christ returns, because all three happened that miraculous year, 1948, and number one was Israel became a nation in the month of May of that year. And the fig tree in the Bible always refers to Israel, proof Joel 1, 7 and Hosea 9:10. Knowing that, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 32, learn a parable of the fig tree. Talking about Israel. 
When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, all these signs of Matthew 24 in relationship to Israel being a nation, then you know that my coming is near, even at the door. So nothing could happen until Israel became a nation, and that was the beginning. Also in 1948, we had the first meeting forming the foundational base for the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. And that's when they met in Holland and called the conference Benelux for Belgium, the Netherlands, which is Holland and Luxembourg. And later on, this grew to 10 as we're going to see, but that was the beginning of the organization that produces the Antichrist and Israel had to be in existence, as we said, because he will make peace contracts with this nation, Daniel 9, 27. And then the third thing that happened was the formation of the World Council of Churches for the one world religion of Revelation 13, 11, and chapter 17, verse 9. All right. What a day to be alive. Jack, you said it. The Antichrist is going to come out of the revived Roman Empire. And the beginning of the revival of the Roman Empire was called the European Community. But I'm not going to call it the European Community on this tape, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. This is from the Europe magazine. The Maastricht Treaty, which has now been ratified by all member states entered into force on November the 1st, 1994. As part of the treaty, the European community will now be called the European Union. So, uh, I'm not going to call it the European community anymore. It's now known as the EU, the European Union. So I'm going to ask Jack if you give us just a little bit of background as to how this developed. Will you please, Jack? I'm going to take this very slowly because it is so foundational, so important, that unless you grasp this, you won't understand that this is the organization that will produce the final dictator who comes out of this union of nations, as we're going to see right now. In Daniel chapter 2, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream and forgot what it was. He called in his magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers, saying, I had a dream, but I can't remember it. I'm going to call you into my presence, and if you cannot tell me what my dream was, I'm going to have you put to death. Yee. They couldn't do it. They were killed. But someone mentioned to the king that there was a Jewish man named Daniel who had the Holy Spirit's wisdom upon him. And it was suggested that he call Daniel into his presence, and he did. And Daniel asked him if he could have time to consider this in prayer. When he appeared before the king, he said something unbelievable. And he was not an egomaniac bragging on self, but he was giving God the glory. So he mentioned in chapter 2, verse 28, he said, that the Lord God hath revealed unto you, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. Now, that's important. It was not only going to concern the time in which Nebuchadnezzar lived, but also the latter days as we approach the end of the age. And then he said, I'll tell you what your dream was. You saw this great image. Yeah. It had a head of gold. Finally, somebody could tell me what my dream was. It had chest and arms of silver. It had a stomach and thighs of brass. It had two legs of iron. And finally, ten toes of iron mixed with clay. I can't believe this. You're a genius. No, no, I want to remind you. It's the God of heaven who's revealing to you, to you Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days, what's going to come in the future. But he said, I also have a message that'll break your heart. And I'm afraid that if I tell you the truth, you might have me put to death. No. Daniel, the Spirit of God's upon you, and I want to know what the interpretation of that message was. He said, all right, first of all, you are that head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar 
of the Babylonian Empire. But, and this is sad, the chest and arms of silver represent the Medes and Persians who will destroy you and your kingdom. And as history progresses, there will be that stomach and thighs of brass, and this represents Greece and Alexander the Great destroying the Medes and the Persians. And then there will be two legs of iron, Rome, who will destroy Alexander the Great and the Greco Empire. Two legs of iron? Yes. Remember when Rome was divided? And they had headquarters in two different places, Rome and Constantinople. God is so meticulous in detailing his prophecies. And then he said there'll be a long lull. And at the end of the age, and this is what God's giving to you, chapter 2, verse 28, the plan for the future, there'll be ten toes. It will still be the empire of iron, Rome, but mixed with clay to represent a deteriorated form. But Rome revived. Ten toes? What does it mean? Chapter 2, verse 44. These are ten kings. No problem whatsoever. Ten nations. And at the end of the time, they'll come to life. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision. And God shows him four beasts. And you can find that in the seventh chapter, verses 4 to 8. And the first one is a lion representing Babylon. The second is a bear representing Medo-Persia. The third is a leopard representing Greece. And the fourth is a composite beast, all of them combined in one, but having ten horns. Now, what does it mean? In Daniel chapter 2, verses 41, 42, and 44, the ten toes are ten kings. All right? Ten horns, Daniel 7.7, 7, 7.20, 7, 7.24, Revelation 12.3, Revelation 13.1, Revelation 17, verses 3, 7, 12, and 16. Total of 12 times in all the scriptures, three times having to do with toes, nine times with horns. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings that shall arise, Daniel 7.24. And again, in Revelation 17, 12, the ten horns are ten kings, ten nations. A few moments ago, I mentioned Benelux, which began to form in 1948, with Belgium, the Netherlands, Holland, and Luxembourg becoming the first three. But it did not become organizational until 1957, when Italy, France, and Germany joined for a total of six, and at that time, the Treaty of Rome ratified the organization. It now was in existence. Then again, in 1973, we had England, Ireland, and Denmark join it for nine. And by January 1st of 1981, Greece became the 10th member. And we had our 10 toes and 10 horns. The beginning of the end. Okay. Jack, you're very excited about giving us all those nations, but, and, and you've, you've said what it is, but I wonder, can you, can you tell us exactly why you think those are the nations that you just mentioned? Is there anything in the Bible that says that those are the nations? <laughs> Rexella, what I'm about to say, scripturally, covers 676 years. When the prophet Daniel stood in front of Nebuchadnezzar, he was not just saying, well, the Medes and the Persians will destroy you. They knew that would happen. They were still alive to see it. But when he got down the road to Rome coming into existence and taking over the empire of Alexander the Great and Greece, they weren't around to see it. But the scripture is dogmatic and here are the texts covering 676 years of history proving that these were the nations I just mentioned. You say, how do I know it's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then finally Rome revived at the end? How do I know? All right. First of all, they had a goal, Babylon. 
Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 1.1. The Medes and Persians would overtake him, Daniel 5.28 and Daniel 8.20. Then that Greece would capture the Medes and the Persians and destroy Cyrus, Daniel 8.21 and Daniel 11.2. Then that Rome would take over and put Greece out of existence as a world power, Romans 1.7. And then in 2 Esdras, written in 90 A.D., this began with Nebuchadnezzar, 586 B.C., and now we're at 90 A.D., 2 Ezra said, at the end, 10 nations will come back, the revived Roman Empire. That's proof biblically. Uh-huh, biblically, but we have a lot of history buffs out there, and uh, maybe you'd like to know if he can back this up by history, can you, Jack? I certainly can. Now, I want to repeat a text, Revelation 17, 10. The Spirit of God is speaking through the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. And in that 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 10, he said, There are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. Okay? The five fallen... First of all was Assyria, then Egypt, all right? Now when Daniel stands before Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't deal with those two because that's past history. But he deals with the ones that are going to fall being the empire of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, then the empire of Cyrus, Medes and the Persians, then the empire of Caesar, who headed up Rome. And he says... One is still to come. Now, historically, when did these things happen? And again, you're going to know that prophecy is true because this did not all happen in the lifetime of Nebuchadnezzar, who was being taught these things by Daniel. He was gone for many centuries already when the total fulfillments occurred, but historically, we can prove that they occurred. First of all, Daniel 1.1, when the prophet is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, the date was 586 B.C. When the Medes and the Persians captured the empire from Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, it was 539 B.C. Not too many years later. So this was his lifetime. He could see it. Next thing he couldn't see. For when Alexander the Great, under the banner of Macedonian Greece, captured the Medes and the Persians, it was in 331 B.C. Two centuries had passed. But the history was there, and we can prove it. Then, when Caesar captured Greece, it was in 63 B.C., a few more centuries into the future. Then, when we get to Second Esdras, he tells us about this empire that shall come far into the future, and it will be the revived Roman Empire. The legs of iron will again appear as ten toes, iron mixed with clay, therefore Rome revived, and that started in 1948. So we're talking about a few thousand years that transpired, and it all happened just like the scriptures and history said it would. So, the Bible and history are always in perfect harmony, just like science and the Bible are in Definitely. perfect harmony, Jack. Because God wrote it. And you know, history is His story. And Acts 15, 18 says, Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world to the end. He knows it all. I He's God. That. I love that. He's omniscient. History, His story. I am quoting now from the book Euroquake, page 59. Jack Delores, and you remember he was one of the strong original members of the East See, now the EU, he foresaw a Europe that will incorporate Roman law and Christianity. That's very, very important. Now, uh, when Jack and I were in Europe the last time, we visited many of these institutions that I am going to be naming. First of all, the European Union is managed by common institutions. There are several different departments, so to speak, of uh, the common uh, institutions. First of all, it's a council. 
And this is composed of government ministers and heads of state. And you know, these uh, presidents and the kings, they want to encourage their people to get into the EU, so they have a pretty strong voice. Now that is called the council. Then there is a commission, which has the power to initiate and implement legislation. In other words, this is sort of like the executive body. And the, the place that they have chosen for their headquarters is in Brussels, Belgium. That is the commission. Then there is the parliament, whose members are democratically elected, and they vote on the commission's program and monitors day-to-day -day policies. And then if there is something that went wrong, they also have a court of justice or a court of first instance, and uh, they have their headquarters in Luxembourg, and we also visited there. Well. The Roman treaties give the Commission the right for legislative powers, and I want to read something from one of their uh, very important uh, magazines from Europe. In carrying out their duties, members of the Commission are obliged to be completely independent of their national governments and act only in the interests of the community or the union. And that is very important. In other words, they're, they're talking federalism there. And under Roman law. Roman law. Yes, uh, I will bring that out right now. Candidate countries who want to come in to the EU must uh, accept in full the European Union's founding Roman treaty. And so they are putting themselves under that. Money from the Club of Rome sponsored much of this. And when the organization was ratified in 1957, it was the Treaty of Rome that formed the laws for what was coming. The law says we will obey Roman laws and Roman Christianity. And that's the goal. And now when they make decisions, it's under the basis of the Treaty of Rome and the laws of Rome. You think this is not the revived Roman Empire? <laughs> what a day to be alive. We are that final government upon earth that John prophesied in Revelation 17 10, just before Mashiach, Messiah, Christus, Christ, comes back to earth. But I'm going to go back to 1890 and I'm going to give some of the greatest Bible scholars and theologians down through the last 100, 110 years, who taught that there would be a revived Roman Empire just before Christ came. And they're from all backgrounds, all denominations. 1890, we had Arno Gabeline, who was a Methodist Episcopal church member. In 1908, we had C.I. Schofield, who did the notes for the Schofield Bible, and he was a Congregationalist. In 1920, we had Dr. Harry Boltema, who taught this doctrine in the Christian Reform Movement Church. Then in 1932, we had Dr. Harry Ironside, pastor of the great Moody Memorial Church and of the Plymouth Brethren denomination. In 1938, we had Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, great Presbyterian theologian. Back in 1948, we had Dr. M. R. Hahn, who also belonged to the Christian Reform Movement and then started the undenominational Calvary Church in Grand Rapids. Of course, he was one of the great Bible teachers on radio for years, called the Radio Bible Class, still in existence. In 1950, we had Dr. Wilbur Smith, one of the leaders at Moody Bible Institute, who was an Episcopalian. And in 1978, we have Bishop Dougherty and Fathers Tumbler in front of the Roman Catholic Church, great Catholic theologians teaching the Ten Nation Federation for the end time just before Christ comes. And of course, many of you recognize the names Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. Walvoord, and Dr. Hal Lindsey, all from Dallas Theological Seminary, as being scholars who've taught this particular teaching. And it's been going on from 1890, and I can even go back a century before that, but we started with 1890, so as not to become too laborious, right up to our time to show you that this has been 
predicted by the greatest scholars of all denominations for one of the final signs before Christ comes, for out of this group, the Antichrist who precedes Christ arises. And you're a very modest man because now we have Dr. Jack Van Impey too. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the study you put in on Prophecy, Thank Jack. You. It's just blessed us and millions of people who Thank watch our telecast. God's been good to me, honey. I've, I've spent hours. I've got something like uh, 70,000 hours of Bible study in mm -hmm over the years, and if one were to sit down and say, I'm going to start reading my Bible and studying it 24 hours a day without going to bed, without ever taking time to eat a meal, it would take almost eight years of 24-hour days to accumulate that amount of time, and never, and I thank the Lord for this, the Holy Spirit's helped me. I've never known the Scriptures as clearly as I know them now. Mm -hmm. well, I'm glad you did it for us. Friends, it looks like the EU is going to become a global organization, but all is not always hunky-dory. I have here from the International Herald Tribune, internal wrangling threatens to delay EU expansion plan. Now, Jack, I thought they were supposed to expand pretty quickly here. We got some fighting going on. Well, you've got to remember that in Daniel chapter 2, the image representing these nations and the final one, the European Union would be in one piece, representing unity. But in Daniel chapter 7, where there are four different beasts, they represent diversity. So they will have their wrangling. But when it comes to the greatest moment in history, and the Antichrist comes to power, Revelation 17, 13 says, they have one mind. Mm. The wrangling will cease then. All right. But until we get to that point, we'll see ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Hungary and Poland banging on EU's door. They want to enter in as soon as they can. International Herald Tribune. From Reuters News Service, West European leaders will meet with their counterparts from Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania, all of whom have signed accords that are a stepping stone to EU membership. Poland and Hungary may join as early as 2000. And this is from the book, The Secret Empire. The British political scientist David Manquind says that the growth of the EU could become a United States of Europe before the 1990s are finished. In other words, before the year 2000. Now, Jack's been talking to us about 10. A lot more than 10 here, Jack. Explain what this is all about, will you? Well, there were some critics, Rexella, who thought that we were in trouble that they had us over the barrel when Spain and Portugal became nations 11 and 12 in 1986. But if anyone had read my book, Revelation Reveal, written many years ago, they would have discovered that I taught that it would go to 13 and then 15 and 20 and even to a world amalgamation of nations. Now let me prove that. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 8, 20 and 24, we read where it goes to 13. In Daniel 7, 8, the prophet is scratching his head and he says, I considered the horns. How many at that point? Ten. But there came up among them, the ten, another little horn, number 11, before whose face there were three of the first horns, the original ones, plucked up by the roots. Well, you see, if you eliminate three and you end up with 10, you've got to have 13. For 13 minus three is 10. One can find that again in Daniel 7, 20. Three are fallen. And in Daniel 7, 24, he mentions the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings which shall arise and there shall arise another, number 11, he shall be diverse from the first 10 and he shall subdue three. 13 minus three is 10. So I always said, once we hit 13, we're on the move. And of course, in January 1st, 1995, Austria became number 13. And I always said it would be Austria. And 14 and 15 happened to be Finland and Sweden. Now it's going to move into this great world government, the new world order, I believe. And Poland and some of these countries will come on board, they say, around the year 2000. And that's all fitting in prophetically with the times 
I believe Christ is to return somewhere 2000, 2012 in his revealing upon earth. Revelation 1, 7, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. But when it becomes a world organization, this Antichrist, the last dictator, will be in total control. Not just Europe, not just the 28 to 30 nations, but globally. For he devours the whole world, Daniel 7, 23, and power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations, Revelation 13, 7. So it started out with 10, Daniel 2, 41, 2, 42, 2, 44, with the 10 toes, and then the 10 horns, Daniel 7, verses 7, 20, 24, Revelation 12, 3, 13, 1, 17, 3, 7, 12, and 16. I said it before, I say it again, a total of 12 times. It then grew to 13, and then it becomes this global monstrosity. But, you know, many are talking about 10 regions now. That's right. The Trilateral Commission, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, the Club of Rome, so many of these secular organizations promoting a one world federation of nations are talking about when it becomes global, dividing it into ten. Now, I don't know how God's going to work. I know that the European Union is the revived Roman Empire. I know that when it finally comes to an end, there will be ten nations, federations, or regions. God knows. But I love Daniel 2.44 because this is when he comes. How have we prayed? Matthew 6.10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when does it happen? Watch it. He's just explained to Nebuchadnezzar that all these nations would exist. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the Ten Toes revived Rome. And it's the pattern for the last days, Daniel 2.28. And then he says, this world ruler is subdued by the coming of the king. When? Verse 44 of that second chapter, he's telling it to Nebuchadnezzar. In the days of these kings, the final ten, nations, regions, whatever. Then, then shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. That's on earth, which shall never, never be destroyed. Mm. That's why we believe it's on the earth. We're 10. 10 regions. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I have some articles, actually, that uh, go right along with what uh, Jack just said. The Club of Rome, the Trilateral Commission, and the Council on Foreign Relations each use a 10-kingdom administrative model in their plans for the coming world government. Isn't that interesting? And this is how they divided it up. The Club of Rome, the Trilateral Commission, again, I'm reading uh, from the book, The Last Dictator, have already divided the planet into ten, ten magnum regions. Region 1, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Region 2, Western Europe. Region 3, Japan. 4, Australia and New Zealand. Number 5, Eastern Europe. 6, Latin America. 7, North Africa and the Middle East. 8, Main Africa, 9, South and Southeast Asia, 10, Central Asia. Now, those are the 10 regions that they've absolutely divided the whole world into. Now, former Senator uh, Barry Goldwater from Arizona made the following prediction. And this goes back several years ago now. In my view, the Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four corners of power. Political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. What the Trilaterals truly intend is the creation of a worldwide economic power. And then he goes on, as managers and creators of the system, they will rule the future. That is very, very strong. Now, Jack, do you th think they're going to rule the future? Started back there in 1776 with the Illuminati, who had a goal to rule the world by the year 2000. I mean, this was a plan that would take them 200, 225 years or more. And they became known as trilateral commission people, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers.
uh, the Club of Rome and many others, all having one purpose, world government. This is very interesting. If you look at a dollar bill, over at this pyramid, you see this eye, and that's the solar eye of the sun god. Not God we know, Yahweh, but a pagan god overlooking this particular monument. And underneath, it talks about the new world order in the Latin language. Now, how could anything like this happen? Well, Arthur Schlesinger, in his book, The Coming New Deal, said that Henry Wallace, who became vice president in 1941 to 1945, was acquainted with Henry Morgenthau Jr. in the 30s, close friendship, talked to him about the New Deal, and persuaded him to put that on our dollar bill. But it has nothing to do with our God, has nothing to do with us. It has to do with an organization that had one purpose, world order, a global government, somewhere around the year 2000, and so that's why you see it on this bill. Amazing, hmm. because it's right on schedule. It is amazing. You know, Jack, most people spend a dollar regularly and they never really look yeah. at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for explaining it. As you remember, Mikhail Gorbachev and George Bush brought the term New World Order really into our consciousness. And in their writings and speeches, you remember that they referred to a New World Order quite frequently. Well, now it is really materializing from the Intelligence Digest. The New World Order is beginning to take shape. Again, from Richard Gardner, and this is what he has to say in a book on foreign affairs. Never has there been such widespread recognition by the world's intellectual leadership of the necessity for cooperation and planning on a truly global basis. In the book, The Dawning of the New Age, Jean Monnet uh, is quoted in, from his book, A Grand Design for Europe, 1988. Author Pascal Fontaine says, Monet was aware of the role that a united Europe would play in creating a new world order. Friends, you are going to hear this much in the days ahead. Then from the book, The Last Dictator, Pope John Paul II said, by the end of this decade, 2000 AD, we will live under the first one world government that has ever existed in the society of nations. One world government is inevitable. Pope That's John very Paul strong. II by the year 2000. Right on. Mm. Pope Benedict the 15th foresaw ominous trends toward world government. This state will vanquish all national loyalties, he said. If these ideas are put into practice, there will inevitably follow a reign of unheard of terror. And then James Paul Warburg, who was a major player in the Federal Reserve Act, while he was speaking before the United States Senate, boasted very confidently, we shall have world government whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. Conquest or consent? Which will it be, Jack? Mm, what an up-to-date book. It has everything right to the end. We find in Revelation 13, 1, a dictator described as the beast. Now, why is he called the beast? Because when Daniel is given a vision of these empires in Chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, verses 4 to 8, he describes four different beasts, and the last one is a composite beast with the ten horns. So, from this point on, when we say the beast, it refers to a man, the infamous Antichrist, the final dictator over a world government. So, let's look at it. Revelation 13, 1, I saw the beast, the Antichrist, rise up out of the sea, the sea of nations, having seven heads, watch it, and... Ten horns by 1981. Verse 2, he had great authority. Verse 3, all the world wonders after him. And Webster's Dictionary defines that as the world being astonished. The word wonder means astonishment. 
Why? Because of his great power, for in verse 4, he is controlled by the power of the dragon, Satan. Now, he has power over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations, in verse 7. Verse 8, all, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And verse 16 says, he causeth all, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead. We'll have a lot to say about that later in this study. But it's global, folks. And I like what Pope Benedict the Fifteenth said as he warned the world, when it comes, it will be a time of terror. That's right. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Daniel 12, 1, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Christ almost said the exact words of Matthew 24, 21, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Nothing like it has happened in the past, nor will anything like it ever happen again in the future under the reign of this beast. The Antichrist. And then Warburg said, we're going to have this world government, either by consent or conquest. You ask who's right? Well, it'll be both. Because Revelation 17, 13, speaking about one crowd, says they have one mind. They'll accept it. They'll say, this is it. This is utopia. This is that for which we've looked. The others will be forced into it, and if they don't, they'll die for the cause of Jesus Christ and their convictions. Because Revelation 13, 15 says, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of this beast, of this Antichrist, should be killed. In other words, the Antichrist has the false prophet of Revelation 13, verses 11 to 15, make an image that looks like him. The world must bow to it, and if they don't, they're killed. Conquest. And so Revelation 20, verse 4 says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and because they would not worship the beast nor receive his mark, his number. And that, of course, is 666 as we'll be seeing. Mm. TV commentator Walter Cronkite gave a thought-provoking statement. We are in a leaderless world. Oh, a leaderless world. Many statesmen are saying something very similar to that statement. Listen to the Intelligence Digest. The main worry we have expressed is that there are no statesmen of sufficient stature or wisdom in the Western world to nurture a complex global and regional balance. Mm. I, I think they sort of hit something on the head there, Jack. Maybe this is opening up some thoughts about a leader, and that's what we're talking about right, here, right. a leader that's going to be coming. Julian Snyder is one of the world's outstanding financial investment advisors, and this is what he says. We have a rendezvous with a world dictator, and his appearance may be soon. The president of the World Federalist, Thomas Ehrenzeller, called for a sort of super being to preside over the earth. Hmm. Dr. Spock, the former secretary general of NATO, said that the peoples of Europe are looking for a man so powerful that he could hold the allegiance of all the peoples of Europe. And be he man or devil, he stated, we are ready to receive him now. So there is a desperate looking for a man who could lead the world. Rexall, not only does Judaism discuss such a man and Christianity, but David Muller of the Pullman Islamic Institute, representing the Muslims, said, Muhammad taught that an evil personality would arise just before the day of judgment, and then Mahdi, the true prophet, would come. So it's interesting. All of us are talking about a leader who will come and take charge, and in the midst of terrorism in the world, in the midst of economic chaos, in the midst of all of the crumbling foundations as far as morality is concerned, crime inundating nations, people killing one another, 
uh, drugs rampant. Someone says, we need an individual who will rise and take control of the world. Well, the Antichrist will do just that. In Daniel 7, 23, he will devour the whole world. In Daniel 11, 23, it says, he works deceitfully. Be careful. Verse 24, he enters in peaceably, coming in on a peace platform, but he honors the God of forces. Verse 38, he's a military, militaristic man, like Adolf Hitler was. Then, of course, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he's a leader that is called the man of sin and the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, a leader who is a wicked individual. And in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, a leader who lies and is a liar, like his father, the devil, John 8.44, who's going to incarnate him. Now, it's interesting that Spock, and he was one of the original leaders of this European community, now the European Union, said, we need a leader, and be he Man, God of the devil, will accept him. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what's going to happen. I said this earlier. Let me repeat it. In Revelation 13, 4, this Antichrist is controlled by the power of the dragon. And the dragon is Satan, Revelation 20, verse 2, for the first 42 months. But then something happens. Russia marches against Israel, Ezekiel 38, 11. And this battle is also described in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And we see in verse 40 and 44 that the king of the north, Russia, for Russia is north of Israel, is in the midst of the Holy Land trying to destroy everything imaginable. And this European Union army enters the fray. They have vowed because they made the peace contract with Israel in Daniel 9.27, as we're going to see, that they're going to protect them. And so the Antichrist is there with his forces. And when I stop to think that they're already getting this army conditioned, as we're going to see again in the tape, it's such an exciting time to be alive. But when this Antichrist enters the fray, and he, him, his is used 14 or 16 times just in those few verses. It's always referring to the leader of the revived Roman Empire, the leader of the European Union. Something happens. Verse 45, he comes to his end. That's when he is put to death, perhaps by the Russian army. But because he wants to imitate everything Christ does and because Christ rose from the dead, 2 Timothy 2.8, he is going to have a resurrection, and that's why all the world is amazed, astonished. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. His deadly wound is healed. He comes back to life. Now, in the preceding chapter, Satan has just been cast from heaven. He's been in control of heavens 1 and 2 for many centuries. But now he's cast out of heaven. And verse 12 says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil is come down unto you upon earth, having great wrath. He's angry because he knows he has but a short time. He only has 42 months left. He died in that battle in the Middle East, Daniel eleven forty five. The deadly wound was healed, Revelation 13, 3. He comes back to life. The world is astonished. Another resurrection. And that's why he has such power now. But in the intervening time, this devil who came down from heaven now incarnates the body of Antichrist. You see, we talk about the incarnation when... Christ came and took a body. Now the devil will come and take a body. And it's only from that point onward, the final 42 months, that he says, I'm God. I'm the God of gods. As he magnifies himself above every God, Daniel 11:36, and exalts himself above all gods. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4.
I have another interesting article here from Brussels by Jackie Davis. Jack Delors wants the European Union to have its own elected president. The idea is seen as part of an ambitious new plan to take Europe down the road towards a super state. His plan reveals the depth of his ambitions to build a federal Europe. Oh, super state, a federal Europe. Hang on to that word, federal. Again, from the book Crystal Globe, the Dolores plan will eventually give Brussels at least as much power over Europe's national governments as Washington enjoys over American states. So you can envision this, friends. Here we have a United Nations over there, so to speak, like our United States, and the capital would be Brussels, according to Dolores. Mm. Look up the word federal in Webster's Dictionary. It means to surrender one's sovereignty. The 50 states have surrendered their sovereignty to Washington, the federal government. So the United States of Europe would mean that they would surrender all sovereignty, all rights to the head of the European Union, which presently is Brussels, and the Antichrist would rule from that area in the beginning. Now that's what the Bible teaches in Daniel 7.23. He devours the whole world. Again, I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary and devours means to engulf globally and then to gobble it up greedily and rapidly. And this Antichrist will do just that. In Daniel 7.25, he changes the times and the laws. He'll say, now we've got a lot of Roman laws, but I, as the leader of this amalgamation of nations, the United States of Europe, will make some new laws. Many of them will have to do with the blaspheming of Yahweh God and the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the book of Revelation. In Revelation 6-2, he goes forth to conquer and all those who will not submit are put to death, Revelation 13, 15, and Revelation 20, verse 4. Oh, and it's all so near. Seems so near, yes. doesn't it, Jack? Many believe uh, that the world government will happen very soon, even by the year 2000. I have here an article by Dr. Grant Jeffrey, and he states this, The New World Order political groups and the New Agers are both aiming at the year 2000 as their target date for imposing a one-world government. The year 2000, Jack. And in the next few minutes, we're going to be dealing with this New Age movement. And I have the video, New Age Spirits of the Underworld, where we really tell you who and what these people are. But I believe that their philosophy, whether it's their organization or not, but their philosophy will propel the Antichrist to power because they are teaching exactly what he is going to claim once he arrives on the scene, and they're saying it will be around the year 2000. Another video, 2001, Countdown to Eternity, to thoroughly explain why we believe so much can happen from 2001 to 2012. But you see in Psalm 90, verse 4, 2 Peter 3, 8, Genesis 1, 31, Genesis 2, 2, Matthew 17, 1, and many other texts, we find that all the events of the Bible, according to these verses, according to the great rabbis and the great Christian fathers, culminate somewhere after the year 2000 and up to 2012. So the New Age movement, in their predictions is right on target. Yes, they're right on target. Mm. John Randolph Price, who certainly is a leader of the New Age movement, put together World Healing Day and World Meditation Day. He says 875 million New Agers meditated simultaneously to invoke the New Age kingdom to materialize. In his book, The Planetary Commission, he lays out the blueprint for humanity to take its quantum leap into the golden New Age where mankind will return to Godkind. Did you get that? Where mankind will return to Godkind. And that's why I believe that their philosophy, whether it's their organization or not, but their philosophy will bring this Antichrist to the fore. Why? Because they are teaching that they are little gods. We have the I am teaching within the New Age movement. And it's the code term for little gods. 
They say, I am that I am. And you'll hear it often. You'll read it many times in their writings. And they identify that with our Yahweh God, whose title is, I am that I am, in Exodus 3, 14. Then the Lord Jesus came to earth and he said, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. So he also said in John 8, verses 56 to 58, that he was the same as the Father and called it, I am that I am. So they're going to use this. But this Antichrist, when he comes to power, will say, it's true that you claim to be little gods but I am the God over you. That's why they will accept him as God because there'll be millions. And John Randall Price tells us now there's somewhere around 875 million of them who say, I am a little God. Well, with that kind of grouping already saying it, it won't be hard for one to say, I'm God. And they'll say, yes, we're little ones, but you are the God of gods. And that's what he does. He magnifies himself above every God, Daniel 11:36. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 pictures him sitting in that temple in Jerusalem and says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. Exalts himself above all that is wor worship, saying, I am God. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to tell you when I'll return. Mark 13, 6. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now, when one sees these little italics in the Bible in a certain verse, it means it was not in the original Greek. Hence, the word Christ is not in Mark 13, 6 in the original Greek New Testament. So what he's saying is many, and the Greek term there is polos. Millions, and there are 875 million of them. Millions will come in my name saying, and what's the name? I am. I am that I am. And Jesus says, when that happens... My coming is near. But before I come, this Antichrist comes who says he is the God of gods over these little gods. Mm, Jack, that's really revealing, isn't it? Mm. And I want to say that this article is very uh, scary to me. What I'm going to read right now. David Spengler is the director of Planetary Initiative, and it is a United Nations world government group. This is what he says. No one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the new age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. I don't understand this, Jack. Connected you mean with people? the UN. Yes, it, uh, that's amazing to me. Okay, let's get to the name Lucifer first. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend in heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, God's throne in the sides of the north. Further on, he says, yet thou shalt be brought down. And he was. He was cast out of the third heaven. The Bible teaches there are three heavens, Second Corinthians 12, verses 2 and 3. He was not cast out of heavens one and two. In fact, he is the God of this world system presently, controlling heavens one and two, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. When he was cast out of that third heaven, it was because he wanted to rise above God. He said, I want to be the God of gods. And so he was cast out. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven, Luke 10, 18. Christ was there, for he's from old, from everlasting. And because of it, he saw Satan being cast out of the third heaven to control heavens one and two. But what was the name of this one? Lucifer. And they're talking about the Luciferian initiation. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, he's been controlling these heavens for centuries. But it's going to end in Revelation 12, verses 7 212. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon and his angels or demons fought against Michael, and Satan and his angels prevailed not. Originally cast out of heaven three, now they'll be cast out of heavens.
to and one to the ground because verse 12 says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea because the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, anger, because he knows he has but a short time. Now he's got 42 months left. As I said earlier, it's at this time he incarnates the body of Antichrist. And from that moment onward in Revelation 13, 12, this egomaniac, now controlled by Satan, having Satan in him, actually incarnating his body, says, I am the God of gods over all the little gods of the world. But who is he? He's that old, slithering, slimy, serpent, originally called Lucifer, and that's why we tie so much of the New Age movement in with it, because we have the philosophy now to propel this Antichrist into power. And we'll see what happens to this old Lucifer in a little while. You know, Jack, a lot of people forget that there are two forces in the world. Actually, we have God who's almighty, but he's allowing Satan right now to be the God of this world. And that's why we have so much chaos and hatred and allowing and evil. people to make their choice because God will not force us to be robots, to do what he commands us to do. We are moral agents who have a free will to make choices. So we can follow God or we can follow Lucifer. Broadcaster Ted Turner at a New Age conference stated that America must elect a New Age president if it wants to survive through the year 2000. Very strong. 2000 again. Mm, there it is. Now, Ted Turner at one time claimed to have been a born-again Christian, turned against it, rebelled, and has said some horrible things against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's even apologized at one of the great religious conventions for some of his ungracious remarks. And then there's Shirley MacLaine who claims that this spirit speaks to her and she stood on Malibu Beach in the movie on television saying, I'm God. And then there's J.Z. Knight who says that the 35,000 year old spirit Rantha speaks to her. What do all three of these people have in common? They once claimed to be Christians and two of them are from my own denomination, and they've turned against it for the New Age movement and spirits. That this is exactly what the Bible says will happen. First Timothy 4 1, the Holy Spirit speaks expressly, plainly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, the Christian faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. They give themselves over to these strange spirits. But what does God say in Leviticus 19.31? Regard not them that have familiar spirits for all that do so, who pay homage to them, are an abomination unto me. Mm. A New Age leader, Lady Vera Alder, in her book, When Humanity Comes of Age, and it's a prominent New Age document, says this, There is actually a plan. World unity is the goal. The world plan includes a world organization, a world economy, and a world religion. That's a mouthful. Four, four different things there, Jack. That's exactly the program of the Antichrist, or the one we call the Beast. First of all, a world organization, Revelation 13, 7. A world economy, Revelation 13, verses 15 to 18. And a world religion, Revelation 13, 11, and Revelation 17, 9. In The Rays and the Initiation, Alice Bailey refers to the coming one as Sanat, which is obviously the word Satan with rearranged letters. Now, that was S-A-N-A-T, or Sanat. Mm -hmm. I don't know however you want to pronounce it, Jack, but I think it's exactly like you said. It's just rearranged there for Satan. Satan. And 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says that Antichrist coming is after the working of Satan, or he performs the works of Satan when he rises to power. Oh, it, it's so tied in with the New Age movement. John Randolph Price, the revolution has begun, he says. Throughout the world, men and women are joining in the uprising and are coming forward to be counted as part of a new race that will someday rule the universe. That's engulfing, isn't it? And this race will be controlled by all of the spirits of the New Age movement, which the Bible is against. Look up Leviticus 20, verse 6, 
And I know this to be a fact that this will be the philosophy of the hour because Revelation 9.20 says, Neither repented they of the works of their hands that they should worship demons, evil spirits. That will be what's inundating, flooding the earth during the reign of Antichrist because Revelation 9 is right in the midst of that period of time. Jack, many of the Protestant leaders, you for one, <laughs> speak out against the teachings of the New Age movement and listen to what the Pope and the Catholic Church has to say about the New Age movement. There is no doubt that Rome is deeply concerned about the resurgence of an ancient heresy in modern guise. The ancient heresy is Gnosticism, and its modern guise is that constellation of practices and teachings commonly referred to as New Age. Thus, paradoxically, what is termed new is in fact very ancient indeed. So they are very much against the New Age movement, Jack. The New Age religion is based on false Bibles like the, like the Satanic Bible and the Keys of Enoch. And then Malachi Martin in his book, The Keys of This Blood, says this. Oh, Rexella, let me butt in first. He was a former Jesuit priest and taught the Bible at the Pontifical Bible School of the Vatican, a close friend of the past Pope and this present Pope, loves Catholicism, loves his church, but is warning us. And if you remember, I had a video entitled Startling Revelations, Pope John Paul II, and it was this man's writings and teachings that really illuminated my heart and mind. But listen to what he has to say. No religion is immune from the zeal of the enthusiasts, converts, and disciples of the New Age movement. Networked throughout the Roman Catholic Church and all the mainline Protestant churches in the United States are teams of former Christian believers, ministers, bishops, priests, and laity. That's very engulfing, Jack. I mean, he is really enlightening on this issue. He really is. And you know, in my video, Startling Revelations, Pope John Paul II, we show how this pope is concerned about the future of his church. And I believe one of the reasons he called the College of Cardinals together to elect new heads and cardinals of the church is because he was afraid, because he says, and we prove it on this video, and says it often, that many of his bishops and cardinals no longer believe that Jesus Christ is God, and that's the spirit of Antichrist, 1 John 2.22, 1 John 4.1-3, and 2 John verses 7-11. to This Pope says he loves Christ, he believes Christ is the only way of salvation, but he's afraid of what's happened in his church. And he wants to prevent these cardinals from electing a pope who would not be in total agreement with his feelings and his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the point is, the Bible teaches that in the final days, there will be one world religion, the New Agers and all the rest. And the Pope says this New Age movement is abominable. It's Gnosticism revived in our day and age. And Gnosticism was a horrible thing. But many of the philosophies of that movement are found within the New Age organization presently. Now, we find that there is the Antichrist called the beast in Revelation 13.1, and there's another beast, a religious figure, in Revelation 13.11, and he has the two horns of a lamb, thus identifying him with the Lamb of God, John 1.29, in Christianity, but he speaks as a dragon, showing his hypocritical stance, for the dragon is Satan, Revelation 20, verse 2. We read about the ten horns often, but there's something else. Seven heads found in Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, 1, and Revelation chapter 17, verses 3, 7, and 9, and verse 9 interprets the seven heads. Are you listening? The seven heads are seven mountains on which this woman sits. This world religion will sit on seven mountains, and that's Vatican, built on the seven hills of Rome, and the Pope, through St. Malachi's prophecies about the final popes, and through the tradition of the church, believed by all bishops, is that the final pope would defect. And he wants to hold it off for a while, if he can. 
But the reason it's going this way is, and we Protestants have had this mess on our hands since the beginning of the century, and now it's infiltrating Catholicism, but as Malachi Martin says, it's in all of our denominations, and the reason is we are coming toward the end. Let me quote the verse again, 1 Timothy 4, when the Holy Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, Christian faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits. Eventually they wind up during the tribulation hour under this world religion, even worshiping demonic beings and spirits. Revelation 9, 20. And in September of 1993, they had the world conference of religions in Chicago and we had Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, we had Islam and 120 other religions, not denominations, religions including witches, wiccas and the worshipers of goddesses all united together talk about unity for the future. And the leaders of the World Council of Churches under the term General Secretary were present along with Cardinal Bernard, Catholics, Protestants, all groups. Why? Because we're headed toward that one world church. And I'm total agreement with the Pope because of it. We are coming right to the end of time and we'll soon see the rise of the Antichrist and as the Catholic Church calls it and as this new Catholic book by Bishop Dowert, he calls it the anti-pope. We use the term false prophet, they use the term anti-pope, but their tradition in the church for centuries has said the final one defects. And because they believe it's so near, we are now awaiting this rise of the individual out of the revived Roman Empire, the European Union, to take control. It's all so near. Jack, you have said that this Antichrist would come to power on a peace platform. People want peace around the world. And you've also said that Spain would play a major role in the prominence of this Antichrist, correct? Correct. Listen to these articles. The Madrid Spain conference marked a historic turning point in the search for peace in the Middle East. Again, at the historic Middle East Peace Conference held in Madrid, Spain, special mention was made of a Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And again, from the Europe mag uh, paper, EU Commission urges policy for Mediterranean stability. In other words, they are paying a lot of attention about the Middle East and how this peace process can proceed. Rexha, I get so amazed even when I hear those kind of reports because I know what the Bible teaches and it's exactly what's in this book. Listen carefully. We will know when the tribulation hour begins, that seven year period described in Revelations chapters 6 through 18, because it is inaugurated the day that the Antichrist, this beast, this world dictator, makes a peace contract with Israel and the nations, and we find it in Daniel 9.27. He, this Antichrist, will confirm the covenant of peace with many, not just Israel, but many nations, for one week. The word week there in the Hebrew is heptad, meaning seven years. We say decade for ten years, they say heptad for seven years. In the midst of the heptad, in the middle of the seven years, after the first 42 months, he causes the sacrifice that's going on in the temple and the oblations to cease. So he's friendly in the beginning for 42 months, changes his mind in the middle. But the interesting thing is that he comes out of the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. How do I know that? Well, this one who makes the contract in Daniel 9.27 is mentioned as to his identity in verse 26. And the literal Hebrew rendering there is that the prince who shall come, this one who makes the peace contract in the next verse, is of the people who, Daniel says, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who eventually destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Vespasian and his son Titus, the two Roman generals. Rome. Mm. Now, they started the peace negotiations in Madrid. 
a nation in the European Union. But what nation? Number 11. Let's go back now to what we said earlier in the program, Daniel 7, verse 7. He's considering the horns, and he said, verse 8, And there came up among the ten another little horn. Who was number 11 in 1986? Spain. Where did the negotiations begin? Spain. What was one of the things they discussed at Madrid about the peace process? A temple <laughs> in Jerusalem. Why is that important? Because this one who makes the contract also sits in a temple in Jerusalem, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. And the peace is going to last, as I said, for 42 months. And they're going to say, peace, peace. But there'll be no peace, Jeremiah 6, 14, Jeremiah 8, 11. And when they say, peace and safety, sudden destruction come, comes upon them. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. And that's when Russia marches against Israel in Ezekiel 38, 11. So there's going to be a steadfast peace treaty and then it will be broken in the middle of that seven-year period, right? And the night the Antichrist goes to the Middle East to sign the contract, the one who comes out of the European Union, the revived Roman Empire, that is the moment, the 2,520-day period, the seven-year period of tribulation begins. Ooh, that is... Very exacting, Jack. Right up front on this video, I said that we would be talking about a mark of the beast. Now, this Antichrist, I take it, is going to give a mark to everybody on earth. When will this take place? Uh, in Revelation chapters 6 to 18, we have the seven-year period, and it only takes place the last 42 months of that horrendous hour upon earth. All right. Let's see how Europe is coming along with having one currency for the whole continent. Brussels takes the first step to Euro currency. It is intended that by 1999, at the latest, the European currency, the ECU, will replace the currencies of the member states. Hmm, they're coming right along. This is from the Europe magazine. The EU has its own banking institution for long-term financing. The European Investment Bank, established by the Treaty of Rome, takes care of that, Jack. And the Treaty of Rome takes care of the banking system. Yeah. There it is again. This is from the book, The Decade of the Apocalypse. In 1987, the Belgians minted the first ECU silver coins. Now listen to what they imprinted on it. Imprinted on the coins was the bust of Emperor Charles V, who was born in the Belgian town of Ghent. We've been there many times, Jack. <laughs> in 1500, and was crowned head of the Holy Roman Empire in 1519. Charles V was chosen to be immortalized in the first ever ECU because of the striking geographical similarity between the common market and the Holy Roman Empire. There you Whoa. go, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> what is the mark of the beast? Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. This is the Antichrist carrying out his program. It says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead that no man, no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six, or 666. Six, six. Now, here's one plausible explanation. Six is the number of man in the Bible. Three is the number of perfection. Since there are three sixes, it typifies man trying to reach Godhood, which is what the Antichrist and the New Age movement are attempting to do. So it's logical. Of course, we don't demand that you accept that idea, but at least it's plausible, as I said before. Now, presently in Belgium, they have what they call the beast, and it is the Brussels Economic Accounting Surveillance Terminal. <laughs> These things aren't just happenstance. I believe it's prophecy 
rapidly coming to a head because it's the hour for Jesus Christ to return. But anyway, this number is given at this particular time, and I was amazed as you read that article about the banking system being approved by the Treaty of Rome. Folks, you got to see this as the revived Roman Empire, and then also they, on their first ECU coin, placed the image of King Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire because that, along with the EU, so resembled one another. Of course, that's Bible prophecy. Now, I want you to remember what I said a moment ago, that in Daniel chapter 7, verses 8, 20, and 24, the eleventh nation to join plays a great part in the history of all that's going to happen. And that eleventh nation joining the European community, now the European Union, was Spain in 1986. And do you know that King Charles V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, was also King Charles I of Spain? Don't you see how Spain fits into this? And they had their first meeting for this peace conference, as we discussed a few moments ago, at Spain. And they discussed the temple site in Jerusalem at Spain because this Antichrist will sit in the temple in Jerusalem. Spain's behind it all. Not only that, but in 1060 to 1100, Godfrey Bolin captured Jerusalem and was given the title King of Jerusalem. And he is the forefather of the present king of Spain, Juan Carlos. So this title has been passed on to these kings, and God only knows what part they will play in all of this in the future. But it's coming together fast. But you put a lot of emphasis on Spain, don't you? Oh, I really do, Rexel. Yeah. Are we going to a cashless society? I have to admit that I probably use my credit cards more than I use cash these days. And that's why I'm cashless. <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> true, that's probably true. Dr. Larry Pollard states this. My friend, who is a bank manager in a Southern California Bank America, tells me that all their managers have been briefed on the advent of a total cashless economics system. Well, uh, I can understand how it's going in that direction. From Power Shift, the book written by Alvin Toffler, he says, barring nuclear holocaust or a technological cataclysm, electronic money will proliferate and drive out most alternatives. Third wave money increasingly consists of electronic pulses. Electronic blips can be swapped for goods or services. I can understand how it's coming to this more and more, can't you, Jack? Understand it is minor. We have to go to it because crime is sweeping the world right now. We have a Russian mafia, Italian mafia, Chinese mafia, South American mafia. We have the drug cartel in Colombia, and it's an international problem, and they use cash, laundering money to do these things. But once everything becomes electronic, we will not make any transactions that cannot be traced. So it will become that as we go to that mark of the beast in Revelation 13 verses 16 and 18. But in order to come to that, money has to become worthless. And so do other valuables, precious metals. That's why Ezekiel 7, 19 says, they shall cast their silver into their streets and their gold shall be removed. And their silver and gold shall not be able to save them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. And that's during the tribulation hour because these things are no longer in effect. And that's why James chapter 5 verses 1 to 3 states, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. You have heaped treasure together for the last days, but now it's gone. It's worthless mm. because they have discovered how to go to a system that keeps track on everybody. Mm. Well, well, talk about keeping track of everybody. This is from USA Today. National Citizen ID is proposed. All U.S. citizens and legal immigrants would get the equivalent of a national ID card under an expected proposal to Congress by the Commission of Immigration Reform. Yes, Jim. Let me just stop there, Rexella. You know how close they are to keeping track on every human being? 
First of all, the University of Edinburgh now claims to have a computer that does 40 billion arithmetic transactions per second. Oh. 40 billion per second. But wait, mm. it's only one of the 10 fastest in the world. And Newsweek tells us that by 1997, we will have a computer that does one trillion pieces of information per second. Not million, not billion, one trillion per second. Oh. You think they won't keep track on us? And listen, right now in America, there are 14 billion pieces of information on file for the American citizens, 16 files per person. Ooh. It's happening already. Oh, my. We're getting ready. Well, listen to this, Jack. Automatic ID news, and then it's talking about something I'd never heard about. New DOD system tracks refugees. And what is DOD? It's a radio frequency human tracking system. Now, you have one right, right here on the set, don't Terry you, Terry Cook gave this to me at the Prophecy Conference, and this is what 50,000 Haitians and Cubans are now wearing at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Our United States Navy has riveted these things to their wrists. And they say if they get them off, the next thing is wire. And then finally, if that doesn't work, they will embed a microchip the size of a grain of rice in and under the skin. But what is this thing? It's a responder, a nine-digit number that picks up radio frequencies. And as they wear this, there are banks of computers at the Blue Caribbean where everything is housed in a one-story building that connects these computers, scores of them, through LAN cable systems into a CCD photo camera and to finger scanning transmitters and to, get this, radio frequency transponder readers. So through all of these things now, they are able to trace where these people are at all times, and they say the next thing they'll do is bring this to America, placing them at all of our borders to keep illegal immigrants from entering. You've mm. seen it, folks. Mm. There it is. Mm. And the little children, according to this article, have it on their ankles. Yes. You know, uh, so that it would fit them. And you know, it's the right wrist. Isn't that strange? In the light of Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18, that's the right hand that's used. Mm. But that's not it yet. That's the beginning. Mm. All right. How can they keep track of everybody? Well, this might be an answer, too. U.S. raid stores selling spy gear openly. Well, now, listen to how this could happen. According to David M. Carlson, Senior Vice President of Corporate Information Systems, technology exists today that can easily track the movements and activities of every citizen. A government that can do this can control its people. Well, it's a view from the sky, according to USA Today. Satellites keep eye on earthly activities, and in Brussels, they've already incorporated it to a little bit of an extent. And that's the headquarters of the European Union and the place where Antichrist arises. Yes, this is from the European, um, European paper. Brussels has launched spy satellite surveillance of Europe's 9 million farmers in the intensifying war against fraud. In all but two of the 12 member states, the fields of thousands of farmers who make bogus claims for hefty EU subsidies are being detected with pinpoint accuracy. So they can keep their eye on what's really happening in all those fields of Europe. Satellites today. in space. Mm -hmm. And they can pinpoint from miles and miles in space, a car or a person walking around. We're living in unbelievable times. You see, man wants to become God. And the Antichrist will say, I am God, Second Thessalonians 2, 4. And he'll want to show the world he has some of the qualities of God, but he is not omniscient, meaning that he knows everything. Only Yahweh God knows everything about everything and all things about all things, but this one will have to use man-made computers, satellites, and everything to administer his 
so-called kingly reign, as he calls himself God. So, only God can do these things. Jeremiah 16, 17, Yahweh God is speaking, he says, Mine eyes are upon all their ways. Jeremiah 23, 24, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? And Hebrews 4, 13 adds, All things are naked and open unto the eyes with him with whom we have to do. He sees us. The Antichrist will through all of this surveillance equipment. Hmm. All right, Jack has told us time and again that when this Antichrist that comes out of the EU makes himself known, he's going to set up an image in the Middle East, and he's going to have people fall down and worship that image. Well, um, there is an image that I'd like you to see on the screen right now, and is, it is a robotic priest who prays over the dead, the owner of the Yokohama Churu, Cemetery in Tokyo recently introduced a $200,000 mechanical Buddhist priest with blinking eyes, convincing skin tone, and a moving mouth. The device chants sutras each morning for the recently departed, then departs into the ceiling. He actually disappears before their eyes. And uh, that's sort of Just like what you're talking about. a plain robot. Mm -hmm. Folks, did you see that? A plain robot doing this thing. And people are coming to the services and being perfectly contented that a robot is leading them in their worship. But when this Antichrist sets up his image, life will be added to it. And this next article is a blockbuster. Yes, this is from Knight Ritter Newspapers. And they are quoting a British physicist, Stephen Hawking. He says, we've created life in our own image. Computer viruses, he said, are alive. I think computer viruses should count as life, said Hawking. The giga genius, whose 1983 book, A Brief History of Time, put him in maybe second place behind Albert Einstein in the Deep Thinker's Hall of Fame. Now, we should pay attention to such a man, right, Jack? We really should. And, you know, I read further articles on that, and they said, this man is such a genius, and he knows so much about it all, and they said, there is no way we can dispute what he's saying, that there is life in all of this. These computer viruses are life. And when this Antichrist image is set up in that temple, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, the Bible teaches in Revelation 13, 15, that life is placed in the image. What? He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak. Not just a mere robot using some recording, but life in the image. No wonder they'll believe this Antichrist is God because of the miracles that the false prophet in Revelation 13, 11 and onward is accomplishing through him. From Industry Week magazine, radio frequency identification tag, tiny enough to be dwarfed by a fingertip, a new radio frequency identification tag is easily accessed or modified, says Donald Small, Vice President of Hughes International Devices in Tustin, California. Uh, there we have it again, Jack. They're talking about radio devices. Radio frequencies. Mm -hmm. This is something about the Soviet mind control radio. This is from Popular Communications magazine. A recent American intelligence report claims that the Soviets have made great strides in mind control weaponry. I'm going to turn the page here and go on to something I think you'll want to hear. The question is how microwaves of certain frequencies and densities might interact with a human organism and how they might be used for mind control, mind reading, or other exotic purposes. The implications here are overwhelming, where they could actually control your mind by microwaves. Right. This radio frequency controlling minds, because people say, well, why would anyone want to accept the number 666 when the Bible says that those who do are hopelessly and helplessly lost and doomed forever and forever? Why? Because mind-altering frequencies could pave the way 
for such a condition. Mm. Jack, I have another interesting article here on radio frequency ID. This is from the spokesman from Troven a Corporation, and he says this, once the biochip is implanted, it becomes part of you with unlimited lifespan. Once implanted, the identification tag is virtually impossible to retrieve. He goes on to say that with the latest technology, the number of possible code combinations is close to one trillion. Can you imagine that? One trillion from that little implantation. There'll be no problem keeping track of five billion of us when this thing can keep track of one trillion. It's unlimited. Now, Rexella, the thing that so interested me about all of this is that it has to do with radio frequencies and transponding readers to pick up the frequencies. And right now, two million of these microchips have been implanted in our pets, right in the neck area, between their shoulder blades. Two million. And the veterinarians and others say, if we can do it to pets, we can do it to children, so that wherever your children are in the world, through radio frequencies, we could find them for you on these digits. That's amazing. And H.L. Stoddard says that this is the thing of the future. If we can do it on animals, we will be able to do it on human beings. You know, I'm amazed that all of these things are appearing in secular magazines, secular books by scholars, physicists, scientists, and others, and it all agrees with the Word of God. Yes. We're right on track scripturally, prophetically, for the greatest event in history. Why? I don't look forward to that, but it means since Antichrist is coming, our Savior will soon be here, for He comes seven years later. But let me say this right now. Radio frequencies. When Satan was cast out of heaven, number three, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, already quoted in the video, he was only cast out of the third heaven, not coming downward now, heavens two and one. Presently, he is the prince of the power of the air. He controls the airwaves, the radio frequencies. Huh. I'm not amazed that they're using these frequencies in connection with an upcoming number and satellites to keep track of people because the prince of the power of the air who incarnates the body of Antichrist is behind it all. You know, the reason we Christians have such a struggle in this world is because we wrestle against these evil, wicked spirits in high places. Ephesians 6.12, Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, other human beings. If we do, we might win. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirit, spirit wickedness in high places where the frequencies are. It's the prince of the power of the airwaves. It's behind all of it. Mm. So the Antichrist, the devil in human flesh, will use these things as natural as can be. Now, Jack, I was just uh, sitting here thinking that Satan is so powerful, but I am so happy that you and I serve a God who is all-powerful. Mm. You know? Amen. We don't have to be afraid no. in these days, actually, because we serve a living God who's all-powerful. I really like that thought when we're going through so many things like this. It's, it could be very confusing and very depressing if you don't know the Lord God. Well, this is from World Travel Magazine. Your hand is your passport. Technology cuts the time spent in line. If you ever traveled out of the United States, you know how really tiring it is to stand in line and have to show your passport at immigration. Well, the United States Department of Justice, Immigration and Naturalization Services has now produced INS Pass. And I'd like for you to watch right now to see exactly how it works. Imagine a time when travelers to this country will be screened and identified by a scanning system so sophisticated it only takes a touch of one's hand. Welcome, traveler. Before proceeding, please step forward and place your hand on the biometric recognition sphere. 
You may now enter. It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie. Well, science it is. But fiction, not anymore. Travelers with INSPADS don't have to wait in these lines. They go directly to a specially designated lane with an INSPADS stand, like this one. Designed to resemble an automated teller machine, the INSPADS stand has a slot for travelers to insert their INSPADS cards. Next, members carefully place their fingers against a set of positioning pins on the screen of the biometric hand scanner. Within seconds, the scanner records a complex three-dimensional measurement of each traveler's hand. Mm, I wish I had one of those for the next time that we go visit your relatives in Belgium. Yeah, and then we wouldn't have to wait in those long lines, but the point is, Revelation 13, 16 to 18, that it has to do with the right hand. Did you see which hand was being used? <laughs> what a time to be alive, Rexella. That's right. John Randolph Price, one of the most famous New Age teachers, describes a message his spirit guide revealed to him. Now, friends, I think this is probably one of the most scary and um, awful things I've read in a long time. Asher is his spirit guide, and he says that two and a half billion people might have to be wiped off the face of the earth. And then Call says that one-third of humanity must pass away by the year 1999 for the New Age Kingdom to come to pass. Explain this to me, will you, Jack? These New Agers are not worried about people dying because they believe in reincarnation. And even when they talk about murder, they say it's not a terrible thing because perhaps when the person is reincarnated, comes back into this world, he may come up on a higher level of society. But they say we will have to eliminate millions, yeah, even up to over two billion for the future. And you know how it all will work? Those who refuse the mark of the beast will not be allowed to live. Let's go back again. This computer that gets life, the image of the beast that begins to speak in Revelation 13, 15, it says, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of this beast should be killed. You must bow to the image of the final world dictator if you want to live. Then Revelation 20 verse 4 pictures it as having happened. For he says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, 666, in their right hand or forehead. So these things must come. But you know, as I said so often, Jesus said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 9, when these things come to pass, be not frightened. Be not terrified, for these things must first come, and then the kingdom of God, return of Messiah to this earth. Plus, I believe that we believers who are prepared will miss this horrendous hour, because this mark is administered during the final 42 months of the tribulation period, and I believe will be gone before any of the seven-year period begins. We're caught up to meet him in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, when we hear the shout of Revelation 4, 1, come up hither. And after we're gone, chapter 4, the tribulation begins in chapter 6 through 18. And since the book of Revelation is written chronologically, Revelation 1, 19, we are gone. Mm. Thank the Lord. Amen, Jack. Tell me how... What I'm going to read right now ties in with the Antichrist. Will you please? Uh, this is quite a, a shocking thing that's happening over in Europe. Europeans are in favor of a common defense policy. Over three out of four Europeans, or 77 percent, feel that the member states of the European community should pursue a common defense policy. This is from the International Herald Tribune. Three nations launch Eurocorps, inhaling it as a sign of the future. Strasbourg, France. France, Germany, and Belgium inaugurated the Eurocorps, hailing the new military unit as the nucleus of a future European 
army. You know, friends, that would be a pretty strong army. You put all those nations together of the of the EU, Jack, you've got a pretty strong Especially force there. Especially if they grow to 28 European nations as they're planning for the future. Yes, well, the Eurocore is the central building stone for a European defense. Today's celebration of the official creation of the Eurocore is an important moment in the history of our continent. Uh, then from the Intelligence Digest, France has called for the setting up of a multinational European intervention force, a far more ambitious project than the France, German, and Belgian Eurocorps now has created. So they want to expand it much, much more than they've already done. Mm. One more article, and then please tie it in for us, Jack. Two days before France's July 14th Independence Day celebration, German troops for the first time since World War II paraded down the Champs-Élysées in Paris as part of the new Eurocorps. The German soldiers joined the troops of France, Belgium, Spain, and Luxembourg in a procession of Europe's new army. And you realize the significance of that, don't you? Because the French people are a little bit nervous about having these German soldiers come in. Of course, this was to celebrate the beginning of the Eurocorps, Jack. Oh, you're about to hear the most convincing evidence that everything we're talking about is for the now. It's here, folks. Why? I said earlier on this tape that the Antichrist begins his reign by making a peace contract with Israel and the nations for seven years duration, Daniel 9.27. But that contract is broken after 42 months, and who's the culprit behind the dissolution of all of this peace negotiation plan? Russia. They come from the north, Ezekiel 38.15, against Israel. But when? Oh, chapter 38, verse 11. Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, representing Russia, says, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages to them that are at rest that dwell safely. Unwalled villages in Bible times always represented no defense. They had no preparations. In our day, we had the forts against the Indians. Back then, they had the walled villages against invaders. But they go against a nation that has so believed in the peace process that they are not ready. And Russia says, I'll go against them that are at rest, that dwell safely. Since Israel became a nation in 1948, she's never been at rest. Her surveillance teams are working around the clock 24 hours a day. But there's a time coming when she'll say, peace, peace. Jeremiah 6.14 and Jeremiah 8.11. Ah, it's finally here. And then Russia moves. But this is the point. Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, also picture this invasion of Israel by the king of the north. And if you draw a line from Israel to the North Pole, you go right through Moscow. And this king of the north meets another army there. And it's the army of the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. And there has never been such an army, for there has never been a revived Roman Empire until our time. And the army is now forming. Think of it. Not only that, but when he gathers all nations together at a place called Armageddon for the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16, all nations converge and they march to the valley of Jehoshaphat, Joel 3, 2. All the nations come up against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, 2, but for a purpose. Messiah the King is about to appear on the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14, 4. So they're marching against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, 2, to attempt to halt the coming of of Christ to earth to rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What? Yeah. Watch this. Chapter 19, verse 11. He comes on that white horse. 
His people in heaven follow him in verse 14. At that moment, he comes as king of kings and lord of lords, verse 16. But here is that army presently forming. It's for now. For he says, I saw the beast. Remember that term? <laughs> and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on that white horse. Never, never in the history of the world has this been possible until now. For there was never a revived Roman Empire creating its own army until our day and age. And that battle is described in Psalm 2, verses 1 to 5. Why do the heathen rage? And the heathen there pictures Gentile nations. And of course they are. The European Union is composed of Gentile nations. Why do they rage? And imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. But Yahweh God sitting in the heavens says, I'll laugh. I'll laugh. You can't stop the coming of my son. Verse 6, I will set my king, Yeshua, Jesus, Mashiach, Messiah, on the holy hill of Jerusalem. And that's why they're in Zechariah, the 14th chapter, verse 2, coming against Jerusalem, because the king has set his foot down, verse 4, and they want to stop it. Now the army is getting ready for the event of the ages. What happens? The Lord Jesus is victorious. And the first thing he does in that same 19th chapter after the army is destroyed in verse 19 is verse 20. The beast was taken, the Antichrist, and the false prophet with him, the leader of the one world church. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with fire and brimstone. And then the Lord sets up his kingdom upon earth for a thousand years. And you and I as believers live and reign with him for that great 1,000 year period called the millennium. Chapter 20, verse 4. And live in that glorious holy city hovering above the earth in chapter 21, verses 9 through chapter 22, verse 15. There is the story of the European Union from its inception to its conclusion, and because of everything that's happening globally, every sign with us now, we believe that Antichrist shall soon arise. But we're not looking for him as believers. We're looking for Messiah to answer our prayer of the ages. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you ready? I want you to look at me right now. Before one can believe, he must admit his sin. Surely all of us do. All have sinned. Romans 3.23. If one continues in his sin, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. That is, first of all, physical death, for it's appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9, 27. And then, after physical death, the second death, which is the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 15. Yeah, the same place where the Antichrist and the false prophet are, of Revelation 19, 20. So one has to say, I admit I'm a sinner, and I believe that if I remain in my sin, I'll be lost. But I also believe that Christ died for my sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Who his own self bear my sin in his body on a tree on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24. And if I come today, I believe this, and look at Christ uplifted on the cross, shedding his blood for my sin, and receiving what he did, I can be saved. For the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. All I have to do 
you say is call on the name of the Lord? Yes. Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God doesn't lie. And the moment you call, if you mean it, you receive instantaneously eternal life. Oh, I love Titus 1, 2. The word hope there in the Old English is guarantee. In guarantee of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised. Will you do it? Look at me. From your heart, pray this. Lord, I'm a sinner. I should be lost forever because of my sin. But you, Jesus, so loved me that you gave yourself, your life, your blood for me at Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me, for shedding your blood for me, and what you did for me, I receive today. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me now. I pray this in your wonderful, holy name. Amen. Amen, Jack. I love ending this tape on that note of guarantee. If you just ask the Lord Jesus into your life, please write to me and let me know this, will you? I'll rejoice with you. We'll all rejoice with you knowing that you've made that decision. And I will send you absolutely free a little book at First Steps in a New Direction. Also, for those of you who perhaps are already Christians, I trust that this tape will help you to apply this message to your life because the message of hope and knowing that Jesus is coming is also a, a purifying hope. I trust that it will help you to do all you can to live for the Lord Jesus in these last days. Because remember this, what we believe about the world to come shapes how we live in the world today. Bye-bye.